When you put it, when we start recording, hit the finger. Hi, this is the Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media, and I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist, Mark Brennan. He's a professor at the Stern School of Business at New York University. He's also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, established 1809. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Chris. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts and topics being used in current media and offer an explication of its essence. This week, uh, we're going to veer from our normal program. We're going to go to a special edition, What Would You Do Were You a Presidential Candidate? And so let's get right to it. Either candidate will do, we advise, or we'd like to advise, or have them consider the possibility of a few things that we'd like to speak about today. One would be getting the budget under control. As we all know, expenditures have gone out, have gone just skyrocketed in the last four years. How can we get this under control? No matter which party gets, uh, wins the election, the problem is still going to be faced after the election of getting expenditures under control. One of the things that we'd like to consider is baseline budgeting. Passing a law saying Congress shall not make and have any more baseline budgeting uh, for their budgets. They haven't passed a budget in, in many years. But the reason they're able to do that is because baseline budgeting is in effect. So every year, the budget goes up a certain percentage. So it automatically increases. And expenditures increase. So having not having passed a budget in a number of years, they're sitting back and just kind of going, doing nothing. But they don't have to because they have baseline budgeting in place. So we'd like to explore that today. I think, as a presidential candidate, one of them should offer, as part of his platform, the, ab the abolishment, the abolition get rid of baseline budgeting so that Congress will have to come every year and actually make a budget. Let's ask our panelist. Mark, what do you think? Is that a good idea? It's a good idea. I mean, it's getting towards, you're addressing one of our main problems. I wonder if it wouldn't be easier just to run on a platform that I will veto every single budget that's submitted to me that is not balanced. That is not balanced. You mean that the, that, way, that the budget would not be balanced? Where, 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 where outlays are not greater than revenues for the federal government. And I would force Congress to make the hard decisions on what has to be cut. These guys can't find anything to be cut. You and I can go in there with tweezers and pull out billions of dollars, no problem. These guys can't find it. As president, I would say, I will not, I will veto every single budget and every single bill you send me until you send me a balanced budget. Well, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting statement, Mark. Um, yeah, actually, we're going to have to add, because of the, you just made that statement, we're going to have to add one to our list here today. Perhaps line item veto. Chris, the line item veto is a little bit dangerous. I wasn't talking about a line item veto. I'm talking about an entire veto. Something that George W. Bush, the compassionate conservative, 
did not do it for his first six and a half years in office. He could only support the growth of government, support government outlays, support irresponsible spending. He did not veto a single bill for his first six and a half years in office. That's disgusting. Uh, okay, but would not a line item veto, uh, veto help uh, 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 mitigate that problem? But in other words, I'm sure that be, being he a politician, he, you know, he saw that is this overall bill a, uh, generally a good thing for America or is it generally a bad thing for, his, uh, for, uh, for America? And he probably had to weigh it all together because they're all lumped uh, together. So a line item veto certainly would help matters, would it not? What do you think? What a line item veto might do is actually exacerbate our problems. One of our primary, one of our main problems right now with the budget is that we can't cut certain items, or let me take that back. First of all, it's not we, it's not you and I. The parasites down in Washington will not cut certain budget items because they are in the pockets of certain lobbyists. Now, when you threaten the line item veto, that's just gonna ratchet up the need for more lobbyists. They're gonna raise more money from their constituents and it's just gonna exacerbate the entire budgetary process. So. I, you know, my, my heart tells me let's have a line item veto and let the president go out, go out and just start crossing things off the budget. But it's, it has the potential to make things even worse, unfortunately. I would disagree with you. I would think a line item veto, and I think the Wall Street Journal made this case uh, many years ago, uh, would... Ah, perfect, perfect. Oh, first, first of all, Chris, you, you claim to be a philosophy writer. Let's stop with the appeals to authority you know, the argument of ad veracundum, the Wall Street, and, and if we're going to appeal to authority, let's at least appeal to a good one, not the neocon left-wingers at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, well, in this case, I, I, agree, I agreed with them, and, uh, the, um, and that's why I bring it up. I feel well, that Chris, they, let, your arguments, let your arguments stand on their intrinsic worth, not on the imprimatur of a bunch of rent seekers at the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, let's get to the, the line item veto. I would think, let's say if you had a series of things that inside a bill um, <clears throat> that, you, that you're for, let's say it's immigration reform, and uh, you've got uh, the immigration reform, which you're generally for. But all of a sudden, and this ha happens a lot, in just before the bill is sent before one of the houses, Somebody sneaks in a small rider saying, uh, we shall build a bridge, we shall fund a bridge to nowhere, or a parking garage in the middle of nowhere, anywhere. Or a war in a country, or a war in a country that has, poses no threat to us. Exactly. Uh, or uh, wherever. Or, or, a, or a bailout to some bank, or whatever other moronic waste of money the Republicans can, can figure. And the one, one item... The, is a blemish upon the entire scope of the of the bill. It would seem to me that pragmatically, a president could just go, woof, x that out, and the and the goodness that was intended for the bill goes forth, and the the blemish. Okay, so Chris, Chris, the, the, now that you've taken the Constitution, balled it up and flushed it down the toilet. Let me ask you now that we're out of you know. Now that we're out of any kind of constitutional restrictions on the legislative process, what happens next? Does the budget that you've now x out a couple of line items, does that just pass? Or does it go back to the Constitution and now they have to have a two-thirds vote to bring those line items back in? Because what, what you're proposing is not only unconstitutional, but potentially very dangerous. So please, how about it? Well, I don't think that, that it would be unconstitutional. Uh, and that's actually why I referred to the Wall Street Journal many years ago. They made an argument uh, and brought some forth some constitutional scholars that uh, made the argument that that is not necessarily uh, uh, and would be actually, uh, they believe, to be within the scope of the Constitution uh, to have a, an, an, an amendment. But what we're doing here is not discussing whether it, it, is, it would be a constitutional we're at, we, we, it would be constitutional in the sense that we need, a candidate needs to come forward and, and put this as part of his platform for Congress to place, 
to pass as a law or to hold a constitutional convention to pass it as an amendment. In other words, right, we fine. want if to we change. Do it that way, if it passes the constitutional amendment, then it's fine. Until then, you know, uh, what constitutional scholars do who come out of law schools, uh, I was at a conference on utilitarianism recently, and one of the presenters made a very good point. He said, what they teach you in law school is how to be an inferential liar. So if you're an attorney, you can get up in the courtroom. You can't misstate facts, but what you can do is you can mislead and basically lie to the jury to allow them to make illogical conclusions from the evidence and the way you present it. Yes. So, yes, the constitutional scholars and the editorial writers at the Wall Street Journal are great inferential liars. I'm sorry you fell for their nonsense. Well, it, but it's, it's really not germane to our subject here. Here we want to... Right, let's, let's get back on the topic. Yeah, because here we're advocating a policy change, either as a law or as a constitutional amendment, for a, for a candidate, candidate to come forth and advocate that. So, All right, well, then let me, let, me, let me throw out my first platform. This, this might be my only platform item as presidential candidate. Can I throw one out? Go right ahead. I would repeal the withholding mechanism on all Americans' paychecks. So, for instance, if you make $40,000 a year, you will receive, and you get paid, you know, bi-monthly, Twice every month, you will receive one twenty-fourth of your paycheck with no deductions. There will be no withholding for federal taxes. There will be no withholding for state taxes. There will be no withholding for Medicare. There will be no withholding for Social Security. There will be no withholding for unemployment insurance. There will be no withholding for anything. On April 15th, you will sit down and you will do your taxes and you will figure out how much you owe the government. And on April 15th, you will cut a check to the federal government and your state government and another check to Social Security and another check to Medicare so that you can see exactly how much all this is costing you. Because right now, no one has any idea how much all this is costing them, and we're all walking around numb to the fact that a huge portion of our paychecks is being stolen from us and being given to businesses that are good lobbyists, sent overseas to uh, plutocrats, you know, it's the old... Uh, we send money to rich people in poor countries that we take from uh, poor people in rich countries. That's you and me. Our money is being sent to third world dictators and plutocrats under the guise of foreign aid. And let Americans see on April 15th exactly where their money is going. We could send every American, uh, once he calculates his tax amount, send him an itemized bill showing, you know, you owe $87,000 in taxes. Well, $14,000 of it is going into ag the agricultural industry. 12,000 of it is going to foreign aid to save people in silly countries. Let Americans see where it's going, and then we'll have a pretty serious discussion on what should be cut out of the budget. Okay, I, uh, you know, I think it's a good idea, and I think a candidate should, uh, should come forth and advocate that. Uh, but just... of course, Chris, no candidate from either wing of the war party, the stupid wing, the Republicans, or the evil wing, the Democrats, would ever countenance this idea because it flies in the face of their entire program. You know, these are people like Paul Ryan, who since junior year of high school have done everything in their power, to, everything in their ability to gain power, whether it was running for a student, graduating from the University of Miami, and going straight to Washington the minute you graduate, being voted uh, biggest brown noser in high school class. These are people who all they want to do is keep their hand in your pocket and on your wallet and take your money because they have grandiose plans to imminentize the eschaton uh, here on Earth. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to take away the power from these people, and we have the ability to do that. They will fight us tooth and nail. But remember, we're fighting against a bunch of panty wastes. Can you imagine you and me? I say right now, you and me fighting Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, and Paul Ryan. I'd love to, mano a mano with those four clowns, I'd love it, intellectually or physically. It'd be it'd be a great fight. It'd, it'd be a blow away, blow out either way. But these are the kind of people we're up against, and we're letting these people walk all over us. It's sickening. The American patriots, you know, in, 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 the, in the American Revolution, King George had a little teeny tax, and these people stood up and fought back. We just keep taking it on the chin as we get groped by TSA agents. <laughs> okay. Um... However, so re repeat, repeat, repeal the withholding mechanism. I agree. I'd be a good one to advocate. 
Um, and I don't think it's impossible because, you know, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, we finally repealed from your telephone bill the tax that was still funding the War of 1898. We got that one, you know, taken away a little more than 100 years after it started. The withholding mechanism has only been in effect since World War II. Uh, it's time for it to go. Let Americans understand how much they're paying by cutting a check and seeing where it goes. Okay. Uh, and so no withholding, and uh, we both agree. And, and uh, by the way, would that take a, uh, could that be done by law, or would that require a constitutional amendment? Re repealing the withholding mechanism? Yes. No, just done by law. Yeah. There, there's, okay. there's, there's no, there's no uh, you know, con the government has the right to tax uh, this version of it. It, it was passed, the, the wonderful free market economist Milton Friedman in the single piece of legislation, and no single, no, no other piece of, no single piece of legislation, empowered the federal government as much as this one piece of legislation did. In 1942, uh, Milton Friedman convinced the government to do the following uh, deal with the American taxpayer: if you owed more than 75, 75 dollars or less in taxes, your taxes would be forgiven if you allowed the government next year to withhold your taxes. Everyone signed up for it because many people owed less than 75 dollars. They thought, what a great deal. It empowered these people to no end. So now we have a bunch of penny wastes and girly men with their hands in our pockets, taking our money, and we all sit here and enjoy it. <laughs> okay. So I'm on board with uh, the no withholding um, uh, from your paycheck. But now, are you, uh, are you for the line item veto? As I... As, as I as we have uh, discussed here. Chris, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a nostalgic romantic, and if you can get it passed as a constitutional amendment, I'm all for it. Until then, no. Okay. Not That's as okay. a law, but as an amendment. Saying, okay, I, but I think an amendment... He's I think, not having a line of veto in the Constitution, and until he does, I don't support it. I, I don't support unconstitutional acts by the executive branch. We have enough of them already. We don't need more. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, the one thing uh, I, I guess Romney can do when he wins, he can reopen Guantanamo, because that was one of Obama's promises, to shut Guantanamo down. The first thing Romney can do when he gets his office is reopen Guantanamo. Right, I, okay. <laughs> okay, so, and uh, baseline budgeting, did you make a, um, did you make an opinion on that? Uh, you know the, the, the minutia, the minutia of uh, budgeting and uh, growth. Uh, I, I would, I would just freeze budgets. No, no growth for inflation. No growth for anything. They're just frozen at last year's level. Well, that's basically what. Uh, uh, if we came uh, forth with a uh, a law saying there shall be no baseline budgeting here for uh, uh, here uh, here onward, that would be basically freezing budgets. No yeah. inflation. No, nothing. No inflation. That's right. That's right. No inflation uh, uh, riders, uh, no baseline budgeting riders. Exactly. Or I, 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 even better might be, how about it goes down 3% a year? Make do. You know, the average American's paycheck has been going down over time. Well, that, that, would, that would defeat the purpose. The that would be years. a baseline budgeting in reverse. What you'd have to do, what we're, we're eager here to have an a, a candidate advocate in his platform would be to have no baseline budgeting at all so that Congress is forced each year to make a budget well, as without it automatically business. increasing or, or even decreasing. But of course, decreasing is just about an impossibility, I, I would imagine. Chris, we'll, we'll, we'll see an Irish pope before we see any of our dreams come true in this, in this regard. Um, I, I hate to uh, agree with you on this, but uh, we're here to, uh, to try anyway. Perhaps a candidate okay. will come forth with one of these ideas. Yeah, we'll go down swinging. Hope springs eternal. Next on the, on the, uh, the agenda, read the bills that the congressional members vote on. So if a congressional member votes on a bill, it is required, and we should have a law that they have to have read it. Otherwise, they're not really representing us. So I would advocate to a candidate
to place this in his platform. And I think it would become, I think it would be a very popular uh, item for a candidate's platform to require the congressional members to have actually have read those monstrosities that their uh, staff is producing. What do you think, and Chris? Mark? I, th I think I think we should have to. They should have to pass. We should then give them quizzes and pop quizzes and tests, and they should have to prove that they understood it. And then not only that, but every bill that they, that they vote for like that, not only will they have to have read it, we will we will take every part of the spending portion of that bill and send a pro rata bill to every member of their constituency. So you can hoot and holler and cheer and talk about how great your congressman is for bringing home the pork from Washington, but we're going to send you the bill. Okay, well, uh, that might be a little drastic, and I'm not sure the candidate would advocate that, but it wouldn't seem an impossibility that a candidate might come forth and advocate that the Congress read, as well as the President, when he signs it, uh, the bills so that they know what's in it, and we can avoid expressions such as the one that Nancy Pelosi put forth as, in order to find out about the bill, we have to pass it. So obviously, these are very dangerous bills, and, and no one knows what kind of uh, uh, regulations and, and uncertainties are hidden in, within the bill, and therefore possibly uh, a great influence to companies uh, in the malaise of the market uh, today, whereby companies are not investing because they don't know what's coming down the, the pike from regulations and laws uh, generated by Congress and their regulators. Well, Chris, my, my proposition was, my proposal was no less radical uh, than your proposal uh, where you expect uh, these buffoons to read a 2,700-page uh, Obamacare bill. And like you said, re referencing Pelosi's comments, they're not going to read a 2,700-page bill. Yours, that's just as much pie in the sky as, as, as my nonsense. Um, but, you know, it's not even, it's not even the Obama health care bill. It's not all these bills they passed. Do you know the instructions for the 1040-EZ when you do your text? If you do the EZ, 1040-EZ, the instruction booklet is 43 pages long. Right. Uh, and who can understand? Therefore, uh, a whole uh, industry... Right. Evolves uh, in the in the in the accounting industry uh, and it, to help people uh, understand what's what's going on. Uh, no, 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 not not to help you understand what's going on. They don't want you to understand what's going on. What they do is just help you comply with the law. They do not want. If you understood, you would sit home and do your taxes and not have to hire them for their silly services. They are complicit with the government in keeping the tax code as opaque as possible so that you will go rushing to them every April 12th, crying with a box full of receipts. And at the end of the process, you'll have no idea what your tax rate was. You'll have no idea what any proposed changes to the tax code that either candidate launches as a trial balloon, how that would affect you or your tax bill. Okay. What's our next item? <laughs> so, we've got, um, we've got several here that uh, we can... Uh, we can present to our candidates, and hopefully one will, will stick to help the, the, the United States. The last one would probably be the most difficult of all, 